Good morning, Judy. Good morning, Phil. Um, and uh, yes, I'm not going to read everyone's bios because they're beautifully laid out. So, but I hope that you will um, you will look at them if you haven't already. Uh, and so, for this first session, both of you were instrumental in the work that's been done and how we have changed how the world thinks about early childhood and what happens in the brain. So first of all, thank you <laughs> for that amazingly important work. Um, I just want to start with the history, as I said I would, and as I know you all discussed. Um, let's start with the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child and then this, the center that both of you were involved, I think, from the, from the get, from the beginning. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I was. And you Phil joined and Phil. shortly thereafter. OK. So what I understand is that <laughs> And that's, we're talking maybe 25 years ago, roughly. Um, we don't use numbers don't like that. Numbers. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it started with the goal of closing the gap between what we know and what we do. Um, and I would, I think that, as we've discussed, that that was a critical mix of science, but also using communications in a really different way. So can, um, I'm gonna start, Phil, just because Judy's in the room, we're gonna, I'm gonna direct the question first to you and then we'll, we'll expand. Um, I'm gonna just turn this way so I can see Phil's I face know, on that I, screen I, just I, a little. I feel like, I sorry I can if see I'm him <laughs> over there. I don't wanna <laughs> have my back to him entirely. Um, so can you start by telling us about that process and the thinking that went into it and what was the you know, what was the goal in telling that core story that you started with? Yeah, I think uh, it didn't just start in 2003 from nothing. There was a whole field before this happened. And the people that got together to work on developing the Child Council with Jack Shunkup being the person guiding it, had worked together for many, many years. So I think the first thing to think about is these things grow and they don't just start out of nothing. So um, there'd been a MacArthur Foundation network on early brain development and um, Chuck Nelson at Harvard had been running that. There were many people involved in that. And about half of the child council was composed of people who had worked together all through the 1990s thinking about these things and actually running experiments. I was doing work with non-human primates looking at how social stresses impact brain development and showing that different circuits are developing at different times. And the time course is much shorter than you would think we could show that circuits that were susceptible to stress at one week of age in the monkey were totally different than those susceptible at one month. And once we could identify when circuits were developing and we knew that period of plasticity was when they were responsive to stress, it really clarified almost instantly how you get children experiencing the same stress but having hugely different outcomes. It really matters what neural circuits are susceptible to the stress at the time the stress is experienced. We coupled that in the MacArthur Foundation with a lot of work in children that were in orphanages um, and um, looking at the impact of severe stress. So we were doing science, but over the whole 1990s, thinking together about it. So that was half of the council that came together in 2003. The other half came from the book From Neurons to Neighborhoods, which was the National Academy of Science um, undertaking that Jack Chunkoff had done with Deborah Phillips. And there were a panel of scientists, again, animal researchers, people like Bill Greeno, who had done really important plasticity work uh, using rodents, and people doing work in children. We were tasked at our first meeting with, okay, what is the science of early childhood? And that took 
a huge amount of discussion. I, and it didn't just happen in one meeting. It happened over years, 2003, <laughs> 2004, 2005. We would meet three times a year, and we would communicate a lot in between of what is the science? What do we really know? And as Jack would often say, what is ready for prime time? What is science that we feel so sure about that we feel capable of trying to translate it to the public? So I think with a group like this, where you're thinking about adolescence, by far and away, the hardest part, at least from my perspective, is going to be identifying the scientific issues and knowledge that you know and thinking about what do we feel so sure about that we feel confident to translate it. Yes, I, um, in my notes it says that, you know, what's well accepted and ready to be shared? And I thought, oh, there's a whole lot more to that story. Than <laughs> so Phil, what for you in that process, what did it take to get people all on board to agree that something is accepted science and is ready for prime time, to use Shankov's phrase? Uh, the process was definitely one of sausage making, I would say. That is to say that there was a lot of discussion and uh, very engaged argumentation around what constituted science versus what constituted sort of opinion. Um, and I think that's really critical. I think in, in any context where there's an effort to synthesize uh, a vast body of knowledge, that you have to start with what Judy alluded to, which is the development of strong relationships among people so that they can agree to disagree mm -hmm. and where you can really have uh, a conversation where people don't feel like they have to hold back out of politeness. Um, but I also want to note that, and Judy alluded to this, that one of the things that's fascinating about the era of work that she's talking about is that there was really this amazing confluence of people doing work with animal models, uh, including non-human primates and rodent models on the effects of early life stress that dated back you know, into the 1950s, the work of Gabe Levine and others. Um, and then people who were looking at variations in adverse human experience. So the work that was done on uh, you know, kids being reared in institutional settings in other countries um, dovetailed really closely with work that was going on that I was doing and a number of other colleagues like Mary Dozier with kids in the foster care system. And I think it was where we began to see that there were, regardless of sort of the circumstances or the geography or even the species, that there were commonalities in the early relational environment that seemed to be driving a lot of these changes that were observed in, in the general population gave people a lot of confidence to say that there is a there there. It wasn't simply one study population or one paradigm or one methodology that was producing this body of knowledge, but rather a variety of different people looking at these phenomena in, from very different perspectives that were beginning to find common ground. And so I think there was sort of a fascination uh, around uh, kind of how to, to pull things together across all of that. And just to give a concrete example, one of the things that we found in our foster care work, when we started, we thought kids are in foster care because of trauma, because they've been abused. Uh, when we started working with those who were studying kids from institutional uh, contexts, what we realized was we were seeing very similar neurodevelopmental profiles, and that a lot of what we might be seeing was the result of a lack of adequate uh, and predictable environmental input as opposed to strictly trauma, as we had been thinking about it, bad things happening to kids. And so the absence of responsive care as a toxic stressor, or what people have come to call neglect in some instances, I think is one of the ways that you can see that convergence coming together and leading to confidence that we're communicating the science uh, effectively. Now, how you communicate the science is a separate issue, but at least like what the, what the topics are and whether we can find agreement seem to be a central starting point. And I think that question of, of the support that 
young children and adolescents get is going to be a theme through the day. Um, but I want to ask to address the, the last thing you said there, because after that, agreeing on a kind of convergence, and that has, and I know in my work as a journalist, that gives me great confidence when scientists from various fields are converging on the same idea, just as you said. But you all still, you had a hierarchy of these are our top three messages we want to get out. I think you called it the core story of development, right? And the We didn't do that until afterwards. So I think late. that <laughs> is a perspective of looking back right. and reading. We started by thinking about how important relationships were. And I think Phil mm. really emphasized that, that we're looking at kids growing up in institutions, kids who've experienced trauma, monkeys that have experienced trauma, rats that have experienced different mm -hmm. kinds of stress. And the first thing we worked on in the first paper we wrote were the importance of relationships right. and the one-on-one -on -one or serve and return relationships. I think Obviously, as this group knows and has worked with Frameworks Institute, mm -hmm. the thinking about, okay, here's a piece of science we feel confident about, how are we going to translate it? Right from the get-go, we paired with Frameworks. Let's, can you just explain, because I'm not sure if everyone in the room okay. knows who Frameworks is and, or what they did, so. Well, Frameworks Institute is in Washington, D.C. It's a nonprofit institute. It really, I'm a scientist, so I'll give you my scientific opinion. Mm -hmm. There are people in the room that work with Frameworks mm -hmm. who might think a little bit differently. But I think what's wonderful about it is it's a group of people who think about how do people think about the world? They have training in sociology, in history, in anthropology, things that you might not think would set them up for thinking about a scientific question like this. They take a very scientific approach to figuring out if we use these words to describe this science, how do people interpret them? And I think this gets very much to what you said at the beginning. You think that people interpret what you say the way you interpret what you say. And if there's one thing I've learned in, yes, 25 years <laughs> of working on this. I'm right there with you, so it's okay. It's the people interpret it from their own perspective. Mm -hmm. And what Frameworks does is they come up with a number of different ways of explaining the scientific concept. They worked hand in hand with the Child Council. They came up with terms, and then they actually empirically test them. They take them out into the field, and they talk about them using different phrases, different analogies, different metaphors, and they get people to tell them what that means to them. So instead of just assuming that people hear what you think you're conveying, you actually got data back that told you how people really were interpreting what you were saying. And I think for all of us who are brain scientists, we really weren't familiar with a concept of doing that at all. Mm -hmm. And we were just dumbstruck. I told a story last night mm -hmm. at dinner, the first time serve and return, which was the mm -hmm. first metaphor we used. Susan Bales said, it was at our meeting, said she was the director of Frameworks and said, you have to try this. It's working incredibly well. When you tell people serve and return relationships, they understand you mean back and forth. It isn't just adults telling children what to do or children telling adults what they want. It's the back and forth that really matters. And I was kind of dumbstruck by that. And I thought, You thought, what huh, if they don't play tennis? Well, or, <laughs> I, don't, I don't play tennis. And I was like, serve it, what? Serve it, return? And she goes, just try it. So I gave a business leader's luncheon talk that the governor of California, 
wanted mm -hmm. to have, who was Arnold Schwarzenegger at the time, mm -hmm. and he was trying to get business leaders to have support for putting more funding into child development. And I was the first speaker of the lunch, and you only got to speak for like 10 minutes. And I was determined to use serve and return. I never, <laughs> ever talk with notes. But I took a three by five card up that said serve and return because I was afraid I'd say serve it, you know, whatever yeah. those tennis players do. And I said it, I got it out of my mouth. I thought, okay, that went pretty well. There were four lunch speakers. Every single speaker said, I want to build on Dr. Cameron's serve and return concept. I was like, Dr. Cameron doesn't even know the term. <laughs> <laughs> never, never about? let on, never let on. I got in the limousine going back from that lunch. I called Susan Bales. I said, oh my gosh, I am a convert. You people know what you're doing. I think partnering science with people who really know how to study how people interpret words and how they think about things is very powerful, and you're already doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, and serve and return encompasses relationships, right? right. It, it, it communicates a whole lot more than just, you know, it tells you there's two people and it tells you that they're communicating. There's and it tells you it's their interaction right. that matters. It the isn't turn taking. It, it is absolutely the back and forth interaction. Right. So it's doing so much work for three little words. Um, but now I know that, so. I'm assuming everyone here is aware, but it's always good to, so it was brain architecture, serve and return. Serve and, and return was first. Brain okay. architecture was second. Was second. And uh, then stress. And then and stress. When you said you all reach agreement, I can absolutely tell you, and I'm sure Phil is likely to back me up on this. We argued and argued and argued. We had. You can't believe how many meetings uh, <laughs> talking about what's the impact of stress on neural circuits and on behavior mm -hmm. on the brain. And we finally, in 2005, reached agreement of what we would put out there. And frameworks had tested the terminology toxic stress versus tolerable stress. And we used that. But we were not in agreement. We were still a group of scientists who knew each other very well, who decided we were at a point where this was an important issue and we needed to get it out there, but we weren't really in agreement. I was probably the person who hated the term toxic stress more than anybody else. I and have read that. Pat, <laughs> yeah, Pat Levitt would try to keep me under control. Okay. Judy, <laughs> just, just <laughs> calm down. Right. We're, we're gonna give it a go. It took off. The term toxic stress just became ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. um, in 2000, I think 10, Nathan Fox and I, another member of the council, were at a meeting in Canada and the um, whole meeting was about toxic stress and he started by saying, you probably think that term has existed for decades and everybody in the room thought so. He says, we, worked on developing that term and it just took right. off. Right. And we came back to this issue again in 2012 and rethought what is stressful, what is tolerable, what makes something toxic, what makes it tolerable, and we redefined it because we really didn't agree 100% on the science. So sometimes you have to rethink things, and we came out with another paper. And I can tell you that we will be coming out with another paper <laughs> on this topic in the next year or so, because this is a very tough topic, and the scientists aren't in complete agreement about it. Right. Um, I want to move to, I want to make sure in our time that we then take this. So Phil, all of this, it was an evolving conversation about how to talk about the science, but you were getting pieces of it in place. Can you talk about how that then moved into policy and the decision to focus on mostly state 
policymakers as your, I mean, the question was, who is the audience for this? And I had the sense that you all kind of, you were strategic in choosing an audience. Can you tell us why and how that worked? Absolutely. I, I do want to just extend Judy's um, description one, one, in one direction, um, which is actually directly related to policy. Um, I would say that at the time when I joined uh, this group, that I had been, as all of us in the research world, I think pretty typically are, socialized to talk about things in ways that were very clear and, and good communications to my academic peers. Mm -hmm. So when I used to give talks about foster care, I would, and, and in particular preschool foster children, I would say there are over half a million children in the, in the US foster care system at any given time. The majority of those kids are under age five and their outcomes are terrible. They are behind in this and they're behind in that and they, uh, you know, their trajectories towards lives of crime and incarceration are, um, are you know, pre predetermined, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the very early things that, that became clear to me as I got engaged was that when we talk about things the way that we are socialized to do to our peers, we are actually communicating things to people who are not our academic peers that cause them to completely shut down and stop listening. Mm -hmm. uh, because what we're describing are things that are either otherizing the problem, that is, this has nothing to do with me, why should I be concerned about it, and or uh, give people a sense of, of, of no agency about being able to do anything. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of the communication beyond these core terms was to think about how to frame things in ways that could get people across a political spectrum on board. So rather than talking about the hopelessness of the foster care system uh, or the, the impossibility of poverty, talking about how a, a strong society is built on foundations of prosperity and that there are things that we can do, especially early in life, that help ensure that all children have the, the optimal opportunity to contribute meaningfully to society is a fundamentally different message. Mm -hmm. And in that way of communicating, we then have the ability to at least presumably, now this was you know pre-culture war times, mm -hmm. so we weren't quite so polarized, but there was at least an opportunity, and I still think in early childhood and potentially in adolescence, that opportunity exists to communicate in ways that really pull on the idea of collectivism and agency and much and, and also on issues as being systemic rather than individualistic that can really make a big difference in how we approach these issues. And so I think the idea at the time was that in states across the country, regardless of whether they were red states or blue states, that it would be possible to communicate these basic ideas about uh, brain architecture, about certain return, about toxic stress in ways that uh, that conveyed something that was highly appealing. And indeed, um, one of the things we heard from some state legislators in Washington State that were early adopters was this concept of the one science, that there's one science of early childhood that's being communicated, and that it's incontrovertible, and no, no matter where you are uh, and where you stand on the political spectrum, that this is something that can get people aligned and actually is a tool for, for bringing people together uh, who might not be, uh, you know, sort of seeing eye to eye in terms of other civic and social issues. So I think the idea that states were a place where that could happen was clearly one reason. And then the other, very quickly, is just that a lot of policy that affects children and families is made at the state level. Uh, and so there's a lot of opportunity to direct resources beyond what these very large scale federal programs bring to bear around things like early care and education, early health care, uh, pediatric primary care and preventive care and so forth. And so I think that was the other reason was just that it was the, a big lever for, um, for impact. Um, and one more question before we open it to uh, the floor here is, in that, in the states and in different communities, how did you ensure 
community engagement in this work and in um, and in the ideas and and because you are, I mean, you refer to the idea that all these states have very different uh, politics, very different um, ideas about what was important, um, but so do within each state, you know, different communities. How important was that for you at that time? And and are there examples you can give us of what worked to uh, make people feel vested in this? I can start, and I think Phil can build on that, so I won't take too much time, but I think we started because, again, I think it's important to realize these things don't just come out of the blue. They came out of people's careers, and uh, so that many people on the council were already known by policymakers mm -hmm. in their states. Mm -hmm. And we made it a point to accept every single invitation that we got to speak to state governments or anybody related to state government. So when you're thinking about early childhood, you have social services and child protection. And if any of us got any invitation, we took it. Mm -hmm. We had a network where if the person who got asked couldn't do the talk, we could find out who in the network could do the talk so that we mm -hmm. didn't miss any opportunity. We took every single opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think that that matters a lot. You really, ha people have to know that you're accessible, that you will come, that you will deliver. And mm -hmm. um, that happened. I think as that happened, things just took off. And we started to get not only policy makers, but other groups to want to have talks. So we gave groups to teachers associations, mm -hmm. to business leaders. I've actually talked to the Business Leaders Association in Pennsylvania, in every single county in Pennsylvania, right. in the middle of nowhere. Child care is a business <laughs> issue. It, it is well, a yeah, huge absolutely. business issue. But they didn't think about it that way before. They didn't, they, they but did once not. they heard it, they wanted to know. So. You know, that requires getting in your car and driving to the middle of nowhere. And there's a <laughs> lot of middle of nowheres in Pennsylvania, let me tell you. I, I've been to all of them. And I think you need to show that you're willing to get out there and talk to everybody and that they matter. We um, took training from frameworks and mm -hmm. other training on how to speak and that was just one quick question is so if multiple people are going and speaking how did you make sure that you were pretty much delivering the same message so we spent part of every meeting talking about this we talked mm -hmm. about what worked what didn't work um, it, we got individualized mm -hmm. training in mm -hmm. how to do it mm -hmm. um, and we talked about it continuously. It's been an ever-evolving thing. A huge amount of effort is being put into this right now in the Child Council. Mm -hmm. What we've been doing for the last three years is thinking about a really difficult concept of heterogeneity in individual differences. Mm -hmm. This has taken us, and I'm the person who actually summarized all the work on this, so I can tell you, we created 980 pages of notes. <laughs> we had 13 different meetings on the topic. We had a huge number of speakers. Individual differences is a really difficult issue to get across to the public, what it means, what it determines, how mm -hmm. an individual is going to react to stress. Mm -hmm. This is hard. We're about to launch a number of products, and we decided we need retraining. We are about to retrain all the council okay. members and how to speak about it. So you don't do it one time, and then you're done. You need to keep working on it. Right. Um, Phil, I want to give you a chance to talk about community engagement or to add to what Judy's just said before we take questions. I would, what I would add to what Judy's saying is that, that the, it's not just 
having consistent messages that can be delivered. I think there are materials that can be developed, and there is a series of videos and working papers that I think have been instrumental. But it's also being open to the feedback that's coming from the ongoing discourse that occurs when you engage in these ways. The term toxic stress has really gone viral, and it is very ubiquitous in public consciousness. I have had plenty of conversations with people who see it as a very problematic term because of the extent to which it can create a sense that something's broken, and especially among black researchers and advocates, among Latinx advocates and researchers, there's some question about whether this is an appropriate term because it may lead people to really think about these things as not fixable and not think about things like plasticity or about how these issues are systemic and not necessarily something that just resides at the individual. So I think that's the other thing, is in spite of the very clear and effective strategies, there's also an ongoing need to be very humble and self-reflective and open to the feedback that's being received about sort of the potentially at times unintended negative consequences of the best efforts to really do things that have positive social impact. The other thing I want to say that's really critical at this juncture, I can't emphasize this enough, is that I think one of the things that's the best about the work that the council has done is that there is clearly a certain ideology that's driving this in terms of that investments of public and private funds in programs that help to support well-being and early childhood and to help support the adults in young children's lives are worthwhile investments. There has never been in this group, as far as I can tell, any effort to misrepresent the science in order to promote these particular objectives or these particular values. And I think we're living in a time where there is so much sort of willingness to bend the truth in order to achieve what seem to be like reasonable ends that there's a significant risk that science, that childhood science, adolescent developmental science can be misused in a way to promote specific progressive agenda ideas. And we do that at great peril, I think. I think the processes that you just described, which are laborious and time-consuming, lead to an approach where you can really say this is what the summation of the science, the careful empirical work and the data are telling us, and we're reporting on that story as opposed to here's the story that we want to tell and can we cherry-pick some studies in order to be able to prove that point. And that's a fundamentally different kind of an approach that I think it's easy to drift away from, especially given the tactics that I think are sometimes used by people who might not share our values. So I just want to note that, that it really has remained kind of the North Star of this work, and there are no shortcuts in doing that. And it's only gotten harder because of the cultural conversation and polarization.